video, I'm going to go over some fundamentals for all the newbies and everything, and probably for some people who have been doing this for a while as well. You know, I've been spending some time kind of looking around YouTube and, um, you know, this TDA thing really sparked a lot of people's interest in these particular subjects. And, um, and what I'm seeing is a lot of, uh, you know, blaming of the government and they're stealing from us. And there is a trust account. I know there is, there's money in it. It's our trust account. Here's the proof. And, you know, really at the end of the day, that doesn't mean anything because, you know, all these people who are talking about trust don't know the first thing about trust. Don't know the first thing about trust. They're just hollering a trust, like as if they have some right to go into a trust. And it's like, you don't have no right to go into a trust, dog. I mean, it, you're not the trustee. You didn't create it. So, you know, just some basic trust law just to study the subject, you know, would clearly let you see that. Um, but Another thing that I see is um, I see a lot of people saying that, oh, they're taking the country. They're trying to restrict our rights. And <laughs> let me just say this to you. When you study law, you're going to see that these people have a right to do what they're doing and they're not taking anything from you. And I think it could be summed up very easily by a quote in the Bible. And I'm going to read this to you right now. Um, I think this just sums up everything. Okay, I'm in the book of Matthew in the Bible. And I'm in uh, chapter 22, verse 16. Now, I'm going to uh, start at 15. And uh, this is a story that a lot of you are familiar with. And uh, But there's so much stuff in here that applies today is just unreal. And, uh, and it teaches you a lesson of how you're supposed to think um, when you think about the government. And I'm going to start at 15, and it says, Teacher, we know that what you say and teach is right. We know that you pay no attention to man's status, but to teach the truth about God's will for man. Tell us, is it against our law for us to pay taxes to the Roman emperor or not? Careful, Lord! He'll try and trick you! Show me a silver coin. Whose face and name are these on it? Caesar! Then render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. <laughs> When they heard these words, they marveled and left him and went their way. Now, this is your blueprint for understanding what is going on. Right here, the Pharisees could easily be replaced with government. Disciples could be replaced with agents. Right here, you see they might entangle him in his talk. Today they say anything you say can and will be used against you in a court of law. I mean... And the tribute money is taxes, all right? Tax money. Do we have to pay taxes? All right. All these kind of things you'll see in here apply to today as well. I mean, the principle is exactly the same. And I'm going to get into it a little bit now. And a lot of people may get mad at me. I really don't care because everything I'm going to show you can be verified. I'm not telling you anything that can't be verified. All right. First thing is first. Let's start with some basic stuff so you can understand what is going on. Okay, the first thing we're going to discuss is public and private. Okay, you can't understand nothing if you don't understand this. You might as well put the UCC1 forms down. If you're in court hollering about you're violating my constitutional rights, you need to put it down. If you're in a criminal case and you're trying to hurry up and run, throw some bonds in, you need to put it down. You need to stop everything that you're doing because what I'm about to show you is going to make you understand any and everything in law. You will no longer be confused. You will understand what is going on. I didn't understand what was going on. I was just like you blaming the government, doing all kinds of things. I was right where you're at until someone made me understand the difference between public and private. And this right here is where how you're going to understand what your rights and duties are. 
by understanding how the law is mapped out. Okay, I actually read a um a book um that kind of um like impressed this on my mind. It's a book called One L, and it's written by a man named Scott Turo. And uh, in that book, um, he it basically he um outlines One uh, L means first year law student. And he outlined in his first year law school at Harvard what he had to go through and just kind of like, and that's kind of like what I patterned uh, my studies after. I had to study, look up words. They couldn't come into class and not know every word in a case by memory and all kind of things. And um, one thing that I found that was interesting about it was in their study groups, uh, they all were jockeying to like outline the law and so forth. And I really understand why you have to do that because you got to be able to see in your mind's eye what is going on like when somebody calls into my show and they give me a scenario the first thing that i picture in my mind is on what side of the fence is he talking about if i'm getting a question about child support or a divorce i know i'm on the private side because family law is private side if i'm getting a constitutional question i know i'm in the public side if i'm getting a contract question I know I'm in the private side. If I'm getting a criminal law question, I know I'm in the public side. You know, it's just as soon as they bring these topics to you, the first thing in your mind should be, is this public or private that we're talking about? Because that's how the law breaks down. And that's the first thing you have to do to understand um, what is going on and how to get yourself out of this situation. So I'm going to start with the breakdown of the law and explain this now. These words, I'll, I'll give you a little history behind this. Um, I had been doing this approximately about two years, and I met an old man. And, um, you know, uh, he was, um, he had heard about me, and, um, you know, everybody was saying, hey, this guy's sharp or whatever. And I, he got into, he, he asked to see my paperwork. And I gave him some paperwork that I'd copied out of some of the books, like One Man Out, um, Cracking the Code, different things like that. You know, and he looked at my paperwork probably for about, you know, 15 seconds. And he tossed it to the side and he told me, you don't know any law. And, you know, I was offended by that. I was like, I don't know any law. What are you talking about, man? I don't know any law. You know, I've been in the in the courtroom. I I know what to say in court. I, um, you know, I back judges down. Um, what, are you, what are you talking about, man? I don't know any law. You know, I was kind of like insulted by, it, you know. So then he asked me, you know, he asked me, did I know what an antinomy was? And I did know. You know, so that's a contradiction in law. I had read it out of uh, One Man Out. Uh, he had actually had the word in there. And uh, when he kind of dropped it on me, it had been a word I'd already studied. And I kind of knew very well. He said, uh, okay. He said, yeah, you're a sharp brother. Okay, I see you got your legal lease down pretty good. He said, but you still don't know any law. So I went back and forth with this man for about three days. Um, you know, every time we'd sit down to eat or anything like that, you know, he'd start first thing coming out of his mouth. You don't know anything, young blood. You know, he's older than me. He's an older guy. And on the third day, he said it to me again. But, you know, something in me said, humble yourself. And I bit my tongue and I said, OK, man, what is it that you want to show me? And he didn't spend a lot of time explaining anything to me. He just drew a diagram similar to the one that I'm about to show you. And he told me that I needed to go to the law library and start studying American jurisprudence. And I took the paper back and just looked at it. And I looked at it for about three months straight, just kept looking at it and trying to make sense of what I was looking at, but I really couldn't. So the first thing I did was, you know, if I'm gonna understand this chart, the first thing I'm going to do is look up every word on it. I'd made that a practice always look up the words because usually if you don't understand something, if you read a paragraph or something like that and you don't understand what's being said, nine times out of 10 is because there was a word in the paragraph that you did not know the definition of. So you have to make it a practice to look up every word in a sentence. And it's going to help build your vocabulary as well and enhance your reading skills. But you cannot pass over words you don't know the meaning of. So I started uh, basically looking up all these words. And I started with natural law. Um, and natural law was a subject I was already very familiar with. I'd al already read a lot of um, treaties on the subject uh, in the public. They don't give it the treatment that it should be get getting treated. They kind of 
approach it as some kind of theory or something like that, which they understand what natural law is. They're not fools. I don't think they got in the positions that they are not understanding natural law. But what I do believe is they don't want you to understand it. That's what it is. But natural law basically operates off seven different principles. And they are vibration, correspondence, uh, 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 mentalism, which everything revolves around the mind, rhythm, polarity, uh, cause and effect, and gender. And you'll see this also in your Bible in Proverbs 9, 1, where it says, wisdom has built your house on seven, as hewn out our seven pillars. And you see this going all the way through, uh, all the way back to Egypt, where they talk about these seven pillars that everything in nature rests upon. And they were the seven that I just named. You can read a, a book called The Gabalion that goes into that in much more detail. But everything starts with the laws of nature because nature is not a respecter of persons. Everybody has to draft whatever they're doing in harmony with nature, which is what these people do. Uh, these people who are drawing up these laws are not stupid people. Uh, they're very learned people. Um, they know what they're doing. And they understand the different spheres of, uh, and operations of law, including natural law. So from natural law, we get something that is called positive law. And positive law just simply means man-made law. And they are the trustees of natural law. They're supposed to be. In other words, a person really shouldn't be in a leadership position if they don't know natural law. Or for all the religious people out there, if they don't know the laws of God. Okay. How can you lead if you don't know the laws of God? How can you make good decisions if you don't know the laws of God? And I'm not approaching this from an, a religious point of view because I'm everybody who knows me, I'm not a religious man. What I'm speaking to you is scientific because if natural law governs everything, then it should be important for you to know natural law. Um, you know, so that is a very, very, very important thing for you to know. And as trustees, they're trustees of natural law. That's why you hear kings say, I have a divine right of rulership. You know, it's an understanding and knowing these laws that puts you on the status and level of a king or a god, where you now qualify uh, to be able to lead people, to, to govern people and things of that nature. But you have to know what the laws are, because if you don't go, if you go against the laws, there's a corresponding effect with that that may not be very pretty. All right. So we can see from positive law, which is man-made law, it branches off into two branches, which is called substantive law and procedural law. And I'll read these to you. As I said, I pulled these definitions out of an eighth uh, edition Black's Law Dictionary. And we can see right here that substantive law, the part of the law that creates, defines, and regulates rights, including, for example, the law of contracts, torts, wills, and real property, the essential substance of rights under law. Okay, and opposite of that, we have what is called procedural law. Now, that is law that prescribes the procedures and methods for enforcing rights and duties and for obtaining redress as in a suit, and that is distinguished from law that creates, defines, or regulates, which is, of course, substantive law. So you have these polar opposites here, substantive law and procedural law. And procedural law kind of gets into um, the um, cause and effect aspects of things. If you, uh, if you do something in a certain way, you'll always get a certain result. And that's why they have procedures that they have to follow. Those procedures are in alignment uh, with uh, the will of the masters who, who is Congress, but they also are in alignment with natural law. They have to be. Anything that's out of alignment with natural law is going to have a temporary existence. And they understand that. So we have substantive law and procedural law. And from procedural law, we get remedial law which is that which affords a remedy as a remedial statute or one that is made to supply some defects or bridge some superfluities of the common uh, law. Uh, the term remedial statute uh, is also applied to those acts which give a new remedy. So from procedural law, we get remedial law. Obviously, if you follow the correct procedure, you'll get your remedy. But from substantive law, substantive law also has two branches. And that branch is public law, and private law. Now, this is something that would be well worth you remembering. You know, I have this whole chart memorized. Um, when somebody says something to me up my, in my mind's eye, I see this chart on what side of the fence we're talking about. Are we talking about the public, which is the land of Caesar, because that's what public means, government? Or are we talking about private, which is the land of God, 
which is all the people who are uh, so-called uh, Christians or whatever your religion is, it should be your primary um, goal uh, to align yourself with God and God's laws. And this is where you find your protection and this is where you find your freedom at as well on the private side. Now, what I see with a lot of um, a lot of uh, people out there who the, the people who blame the government uh, is that the people who blame the government don't have any respect for public rights. There's the thing called public rights doctrine. A lot of people out there, they I'm seeing they just want to go and take something because they think something. Um, because they think something has been taken from them. And um, but what it is, is when you begin to understand the law, OK, it's just like a house. All right, you can live in a neighborhood, but you have your house. OK, and I have my house now. You can't walk into my house and just open the door and walk into the house. Don't even knock. Go into my refrigerator and start taking food out. And then I come into the house and say, hey, look, you know, hey, why are you in my refrigerator? You need to pay me for the food that you ate. And you say, well, no, I don't have to pay you. I'm exempt. But yet and still, you know, you're in my house eating my food, you know. No, you're going to pay for that food. You're not automatically exempt. You took something that belongs to me. Okay. So you had to be respectful, not only of your fellow man, you also had to be respectful of government because government has rights too. And I'm going to show you that right now. Okay. And I'm on a, you know, look like Wikipedia. And I think this gives a very, very good description of the public rights doctrine. And right here, let me read this to you. It says, public rights doctrine is that some rights are so closely integrated into a public regulatory scheme as to be a matter appropriate for agency resolution with limited involvement by the Article Three judiciary. Now, um, I'm in, further on, we're going to read what an, the difference between an Article I court and an Article Three court and an Article I judge and an Article Three judge. But notice right here that gets into that. Always remember separation of powers doctrine. Each of the individual branches cannot interfere uh, with the business of the other branches unless they get some delegated authority or permission to do so. And this leads into what is called checks and balances. So um, what it is, is under Article 1, Section 8, Congress was uh, delegated powers. Now, they have what are called plenary powers to implement all of those powers that were given to them by the Constitution. The limitations being the Bill of Rights. Uh, that's why they call the Constitution a, lim uh, a limitation on government. All right, so the thing you buy is just like me. If I'm in my house, I got all power in my house. Now, when I step outside of my house, there's a different set of rules. But in my house, I'm, un I'm not subordinate to anybody's rules. That's the legislature. As long as they stay in their house, they're not subordinate to anyone. And as far as them ha inflicting harm on the uh, private, okay, there are restraints against that called the Constitution of the United States of America and the Bill of Rights and so forth. This is the purpose that it serves. So as you can see, the courts, Article Three courts will not get into the business of Article One judiciaries. They call it a political doc, uh, uh, they call it a um, political question doctrine. And what that means is like, hey, you know, you coming to us for help, you don't need to be coming to us. What you need to be doing is going to the ballot box and making sure the right people get in positions uh, and you be their constituency and they'll fulfill your purpose. You know, that's what they're saying. But, you know, people want to point fingers and blame and so forth and not take the responsibility on themselves. But let's go back to this. It says in 2017, uh, there is a big dispute as to whether parties fall under the public rights doctrine so as to deny patent holders full rights to adjudication by other courts and instead subject them to rescission by the Patent and Trademark Office. And right here, they're, they're just giving you an example of one application of public, uh, of public and private. Um, but the thing is, is that there is a distinction. Let's go down here and read this. These are all cases. And it says, the court expounded on the public rights doctrine in Stern versus Marshall. Stern explained that the court continued to apply the public rights doctrine to disputes between pi private pro uh, parties and cases in which the claim at issue derives from a federal regulatory scheme or in which resolution of the claim by an expert government agency 
is deemed essential to a limited regulatory objective within the agency's authority. What makes a right public rather than private is that the right is intricately related to particular federal government action. And here it is. This is what it is. This is Caesar's territory. Caesar, I guess I can make this very simple. All right, you need to learn how to get out of Caesar's way and stay out of Caesar's business. All right, what I'm seeing is that too many people are involved in the federal government's business and what they're not focused on is developing their communities, building up their businesses and so forth. So they'll have power because right now you're all divided. You don't have any power or anything like that. And you just want to sit back and complain. And then you're complaining about the wrong things because the government is really not doing anything wrong. You know, uh, 90 percent of everything they do, I think, is pretty much on on the on the uh, on the mark, with the exception of a few things. But all in all, you know, they're doing everything right. What it is, is they're looking at you and saying, okay, this guy right here is ignorant and he could also be dangerous. So let's put a watchful eye on him and check him out. And that's what's going on all because you don't know the difference between public and private. So let me go back to my chart, uh, chart, uh, chart real quick. So now we're back at our chart and let's go do public and private real quick. Okay, so now this is the part that you need to remember. If you remember, if you know this, you'll be better than a lot of the gurus out there because a lot of the gurus don't know this, even though this is something that can be very easily verified, reading case law, going to Wikipedia, just almost anywhere you can see it, but nobody talks about it for some reason. They'll use the words. You hear everybody say public and private all day long, but nobody really knows. Well, if you ask them, well, what is public? Name all the laws on the public side. And name all the laws that are on the private side. So we have, we have public law, which is composed of constitutional law, criminal law, administrative law. This should be public international law. And then they also have what is called tax law that is on this side. All those are in the public side. On the private side, we have contract law, tort law, status law, property law, family law also goes on this side. And then they have what is called private international law, which also goes by the word conflict of laws. Now, once you get this down in your mind and every time you have any discussion about law and this pops up in your mind, it's going to guide you in thinking correctly. For instance, you start talking about my constitutional rights. Well, constitutional laws in the public. OK, public means government. OK, the Constitution is what formed the government and it also puts the limitations on government. And what limitation is that? Well, it's the fence. It keeps them over here so they don't come over here unless the only way they can come over here unless there's what is called a compelling public interest. And let's look at that real quick. And while we're at it, remember in the Constitution, it says no private property shall be taken without due process of law and just compensation. It doesn't say they can't take your private property. It's just saying that they have to get to follow the procedure and they have to compensate you for it. And for even for them to even look at it, there has to be something called a compelling public interest. Let's look at that word next. OK, so first we're going to start with the definition of public interest. Now, the welfare or well-being of the general public, commonwealth, appeal of relevance to the general populace. Okay, so that is a one definition of it. Let's go to another. Okay, and now I'm in Black's Law 4th edition, and we want to get some in-depth understanding of this word public interest. Oops, sorry about that. Right here, public interest computers tripping all right now let's read this real quick something in which the public the community at large has some pecuniary interest or some interest by which their legal rights or liabilities are affected it does not mean anything so narrow as mere curiosity or as interests of the particular loca uh, localities which may be affected by the matters in question and that's why they put the word compelling in it they can't have just mere curiosity. Now, pecuniary means money. That they have some type of money interest in it. 
But let's see what the expert commentary says that they pull out of the court cases, these citations of authority. If by public permission one is making use of public property and he, ch and he chances to be the only one with whom the public can deal with respect to the use of that property, his business is affected with a public interest which requires him to deal with the public on reasonable terms. Okay, and that's Cooley uh, Constitution, all right? Now the next one, the circumstances which clothe a particular kind of business with a public interest as to be subject to regulation must be such as to create a, pe a peculiarly close relation between the public and those engaged in it and raise implications of an affirmative obligation on their part to be reasonable in dealing with the public. One does not devote his property or business to a public use or clothe it with the public interest merely because he makes commodities for and sells to the public in common callings, such as those of the butcher, baker, tailor, etc. And uh, this, there's American Law Review. A business is not affected with a public interest merely because it is large or because the public has concern in respect of its maintenance or derives benefits, accommodations, ease, or enjoyment from it. All right, so right here, we can begin to form in our mind what this public thing is. I'm going to tell you this in short, it means the government. Anything the government is related to, like your public school is government-funded school. But when you're in the public, okay, you're in someone else's house, okay? You're in someone else's house. And let me read you something about um, public and uh, religion real quick. There is an article, um, it's on a, uh, I think a, uh, a, a, I don't know if this is a Jewish page, but it's a, a religious page. Uh, and it gets into the right of religion. I'm see if I blow this up a little bit for you. And it's an article that is very interesting. It says religious freedom versus compelling state interest. And state you will see sometimes in place of public because they, they mean literally the same thing. And it goes on and it talks about religious freedom. All right. But I want to go down here where it starts to say, to protect our special commitment to rights, the court over the last 60 years have developed a way to keep a thumb on the scale. When a law threatens certain fundamental rights, and this is equivalent to private rights, the law defenders assume the burden of proof to justify it. They have to convince the court that number one, the challenged law serves not just an important public purpose, but a genuinely compelling one. Number two, the law was well tailored to achieve that purpose. And number three, the purpose could not be achieved by some less burdensome method. This method of argument is called the compelling state interest test. Perhaps the single dearest statement of this doctrine is in Wisconsin versus yonder. And let me show you the compelling state interest test real quick. Now, this is how they come over into the private side. Okay, now, I think this one right here is the one that's really going to get you. Compelling state interest test law and legal definition. Compelling state interest test refers to a method of determining the constitutional validity of a law. Under this test, the government's interest is balanced against the individual's constitutional right to be free of law. You got a constitutional right to be free of law? Are you trying to tell me they know that? They know that? They understand that? But what does that mean? You have a constitutional right to be free of law. However, a law will be upheld only if the government's interest is strong enough. Okay, what does that mean? Let's see if we can shed some light on this. So we're back to our chart. Now, this is the public. They have to pick, have a compelling public interest to come over here and deal with your fundamental rights, which are your rights that are given to you by God, your right to not be under any law, or anything like that, which all of you achieve, you have a right to do that. But you need to understand where it is located. It is located on the private side. You can't go into the public making demands, saying somebody owes you something, using their property, that TDA account that is in the public. It's not in the private. You don't have any inherent right to it. There is a rules, public and private never mix, okay? It cannot mix. They're two separate things. Okay, you're in the private, they're in the public. There's a public trust over here, public charitable trust. They're going to have a trustee of that trust be a, um, a public individual. It's going to be the trustee of it. Now, you as a beneficiary, you have a trust certificate 
that represents your prorated interest in that. And you do have a right for a distribution from that. But you don't come over into the everything in the public requires you to be licensed because public safety is their first order of business to make sure the public is safe and so forth. If you're teaching something, selling food, doing anything like that, there are regulations over here that you have to abide by. There are procedures over here that are put in place to make sure that everybody does what they need to do and doesn't violate um, uh, the Constitution. OK, also, because there's no money over here, all these people are bonded. They have to be insured in some kind of way. Everything requires some sort of uh, insurance. So there can be some assurance about um, they, uh, uh, their performance in their particular duties and so forth. All right. So if you're on the private side, everything is governed by contract pretty much. OK, you have a contract because contract makes the law. This is also the reason why they can make no law that will infringe on the obligations of contracts. So private individuals engage in contracts. They make contracts with one another. The first contract that you make is the, your covenant that you make with God. That's a contract. You make a contract with your wife. OK, these are contracts. All right. All right. So you govern yourself through contracts. As a matter of fact, let me take a, a bit to show you an example of what a marriage contract should look like which all of you should be using. Okay, here's a website that I found um, as sample templates. It has eight sample marriage contract templates to download. And right here you have an Islamic marriage contract, marriage out of community of property, excluding the accrual system. Um, here's a marriage contract. There's also a Christian one also. Marriage contract form. And let's take a look at these and uh, see uh, what's in them. Just kind of give you an idea of what they look like. Okay. Now, here it is. I had to locate this. They're selling this now. This used to be on the internet for free. You probably can find it on the internet for free. But you see this marriage contract, and it goes through, um, you know, the authority. It's real interesting. In the uh, At the top, it says, In the name of God, our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ, we, in the name of the parties, Hereby, before these witnesses are joined in holy matrimony as God intended in Genesis 2, 21 through 25, from this day forward until death. The authority in and for this marriage shall be Almighty God as revealed in the Holy Bible, authorized 1611 King James Version, the Word of God. His word shall be final authority in every decision and or dispute. And it gets the parties, the benefits. It's down here, you can see it talks about mutual rearing of children. Um, it even get, goes into prohibitions. If there's an adultery, abandonment, abortion, uh, uh, you know, all the uh, definitions of everything that you're going through. Um, if there's criminal behavior, dangerous behavior, um, uh, habitual drunkenness, ejection, uh, you know, to whom the appeal is made. It says the first appeal when one party believes the other party has violated the prohibitions above should be in accordance with Matthew 18, 15 through 18. That is, the offended party should take the matter to the accused party. If no resolution results from the first appeal, may demand physical separation from the accused party. See the remedies below. And they actually go through and tell you how your marriage is supposed to be conducted. And of course, you should have some sort of either religion. It should be based off some religion because everything really on the private side is under God in some kind of way. And this is where religion kind of comes into all of this. And while we always say that no one is ever really free from any law, there should be something guiding you in everything that you do. All private people are in a contract, whether you know it or not. There are implied contracts and express contracts. Uh, if you're living with a woman, they call that common law marriage. That is a express, uh, an implied contract that exists. Um, you may, it may be to your advantage to put it on paper. So if a dispute does erupt, now you got the contract that is guiding everything. Um, you know, get this notarized, both of you see it, and go and file it down at the county court or in a public record somewhere or something to that effect. But everything on the private side runs through some sort of contract, and marriage is a good example of that. It's a contract. Um, I study trust law, private trust law. Everything in the entire book is contract, every single thing. Every single thing that has to be done, there's a contract for. So understand that, that when you're on the private side, 
you're going to be dealing with contracts a lot. Okay. Now, tort, of, of course, is an injury to a private individual. It's an injury. You file a tort when, as a private person, when you have some sort of injury. And of course, your status, as it relates also, you have, people have different statuses. Property law, which is some of the oldest law in law that has remained rel relatively unchanged, is on the private side. Um, also, private international law, family law, of course. All these are on the private side. So you got to understand that, yeah, you're, you can be free. Yes, you're free from anybody having to do. You, you have a right not to be under any law. But what you don't have a right to do is to come into the public and violate laws. Okay? You have, if you're going to be private, then you have to stay all the way private. But you can't come into the public and start making demands, start talking about constitutional rights. Over here, you have constitutional rights. Over here, you have constitutionally protected rights. Okay, because the Constitution doesn't give you any rights. As it says, you have a right to be free. Private means the right to be left alone. And if you want to be left alone, as long as you're not bothering anyone or their property, then people are going to leave you alone. But once you start infringing on somebody else's rights, okay, there's going to be a problem. There's going to be something for that. And that is what people have to understand and stop getting out of here and saying what rights you have and things like that. And Half the people who are saying that have never even read the Constitution, but it is on the private side. And I'm going to show you some court case examples that are going to impress that upon you. And I'm going to start with a trust law case on a private trust and let you read this first. And then we'll see, uh, show you another example. OK, here is a case that is definitely worth you studying. Um, it is a trust law case and uh, it was argued before the Supreme Court. And the name of the case is Evans versus Newton. And I think this is one of the best cases I've ever read where the judge gives you a thorough education on the difference between public and private. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to just give you a quick overview of the case. What it was about is it was about uh, this senator. Um, his name is right here, Senator Augustus Bacon. He executed a will that devised to the mayor and city council of the city of Macon, Georgia, a tract of land, which after the death of the senator's wives and daughters was to be used as a park and pleasure ground for white people only. The senator stating in the will that while he had only the kindest feeling for the Negroes, he was the opinion that in their social relations, the two races, white and Negro, should be forever separate. The will provided that the park should be under the control of a board of managers of seven persons, all of whom were to be white. The city kept the park segregated for some years, but in time let Negroes use it, taking the position that the park was a public facility, which it could not constitutionally manage and maintain on a segregated basis. You know, they got the Equal Protection Clause under the 14th Amendment now, where in the public they cannot discriminate. Okay, but you can discriminate in the private. And what this was about is that this was a private uh, trust, but they had public trustees administering it. And it all boiled down to whether it was public or private. And I'm going to let this judge tell you um, what it is. And it's right here. It's explained right here. This judge does a very good job. He said, there are two complementary principles to be reconciled in this case. One is the right of the individual to uh, pick his own associates as to express his preferences and dislikes, and to fashion his private life by joining such clubs and groups as he chooses. The other is the constitutional ban in the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment against state-sponsored, read public, racial inequality, which of course bars a city from acting as a trustee under a private will that serves the racial segregation cause. And this is also the reason why and your trust agreement, it can, when you draft one, you can't draft anything that's going to violate any type of public pro uh, policy or anything like that. That's one of the things you have to do with trust and understand. And now he gives you some examples of what you can do. A private golf club, however, restricted to either Negro or white membership is one expression of freedom of association. But a municipal read public golf course that serves only one race is state read public activity indicating a preference on a matter as to which the state must be neutral. What is private action and what is state action is not always easy to determine. Conduct, 
read minimum contacts that is formerly private may become so entwined with governmental policies or so impregnated with a governmental character as to become subject to the constitutional limitations placed upon state action. The action of a city in serving as a trustee of property under a private will serving the segregate cause is an obvious example. A town may be privately owned and managed, but that does not necessarily allow the company to treat it as if it were wholly in the private sector. Thus, as we hold in Marsh versus Alabama, that the exercise of constitutionally protected rights, notice what this judge just said, constitutionally protected rights on, on that read private rights on the public streets of a company town could not be denied by the owner. A state is not justified, we said, in permitting a corporation to govern a community of citizens so as to restrict their fundamental liberties. Remember, private rights. I notice also that corporations do what? Govern. All right, there's nothing new with these corporations, I'm telling you. We have also held that where a state delegates an aspect of the elective process to private groups, they become subject to the same restraints as the state. Okay, so if you have, so if they delegate the state, delegates, remember delegation of powers doctrine, some of its power, and I'll, I'm going to talk about delegation of powers doctrine, to private groups, they become part of the state, they become a party to the Constitution. Now, you learn this in trust law. If the trust um, contracts, let's say with a contractor, to do some work for the business trust, those contractors have to agree by the terms of the trust indenture agreement. Well, it's the same thing. When you contract with the government, you're contracting to follow the trust indenture agreement, which is the constitution. They are trustees and they can only do what that constitution says they can do. Just like in a trust indenture agreement, the trustees can only do what the trust indenture says they can do. And if you do any type of business with them, one of it is, that you have to agree to the terms of the document, as well as the fact there's some indemnity, uh, some indemnity things that go along with that too. And I'm gonna talk about that with a little bit. But this particular case is Evans versus Newton. You can see it right here. You can go to Google Scholar and pick this up just by doing a search for private trust. And you can see Evans, Evans versus Newton. This is a very, very educational document on public and private, it, all the way through it goes into it. And you're gonna find that a lot when you read case law on private trust, it gets into it more than anything. And that's also when you're gonna begin to really understand trust law. I think two, I mean, our privacy and versus public. I think the two fields that help you more than anything is tax law and trust law and studying those things. Because when somebody says they're tax exempt or they don't have to pay any taxes, what they're saying is, is they're, they're private, that they're not engaged in any business that is within the United States and no income is coming that has an origin within the United States, okay? It doesn't matter if you're private. If you're receiving income that has a uh, that originates within the United States, there's gonna be a tax obligation associated with that. This is what people have to understand when we're talking about public and private. It doesn't matter if the IRS code was never ratified or whatever. You've contracted to this. Contract makes the law. They can make up anything. And if you agree to it through a contract, doesn't matter if, if, if it was ratified or anything like that, you agreed to it. This is why a judge said that, you know, they're not going to look at anything constitutional for something that you've been taking a benefit from. And I'm going to show you that right now where that judge said that. Okay, to understand how the judiciary looks at this public and private thing and whether something's constitutional or not, you need to know this right here. You need to know the Ashwander rules. Okay, this is what the justices go by. Very important for you to understand this, especially if you are looking at public and private. Okay, the Ashwander rules articulated by Justice Louis D. Brandles are a set of principles used by the United States Supreme Court for avoiding constitutional rulings. Now, this is what they look at when you do a constitutional challenge and they don't look at it. Well, it's going to fall within one of these uh, seven things right here. And that is the court will not pass and let me go to it. Oops, jumped ahead. All right, right here. It says the court would not pass upon the constitutionality of legislation in a friendly, non-advisor, uh, non-adversary proceeding, declining because to decide such questions is legitimate only in the last resort, earnest and vital controversy between individuals. It never was the thought that by means of a friendly suit, a party beaten in the legislature could transfer to the courts of inquiry as to the constitutionality of a legislative act. 
And notice that they're talking about in the legislature. We're talking about legislative courts and then trying to take it from an Article One to an Article Three court. Number two, the court will not anticipate a question of constitutional law in advance of the necessity of deciding it. It is not the habit of the court to decide questions of a constitutional nature unless absolutely necessary to a decision of the case. And this is also, I want you to think about separation of powers doctrine while we're reading all of this. Remember, they can't get involved in what's going on in the legislature. Okay, it goes. Number three, the court would not formulate a rule of constitutional law broader than is required of the precise facts to which it is to be applied. Four, the court would not pass upon a constitutional question, although properly presented by the record, if there's also present some of the ground upon which the case may be dispensed of. I want you to think about exhaustion of your administrative remedies, all right? This rule is found most varied application. Thus, if a case can be decided on either of two grounds, meaning Article One or Article Three, one involving a constitutional question, Article Three, the other a question of statutory construction, Article One or general law, the court would decide only the latter. They're gonna use this, the question of statutory construction. Once again, why do they do that? Because the separation of powers doctrine, they always got to defer to the legislature first if it is something involving the legislature. They have to respect that other house and make sure that everything has been done in that house first to give you your remedy before you can take it over there in an Article Three court. Because you've been, you've been busy, busy in, their, in that particular house. It goes, appeals from the highest court of a state challenging its decision on a question under the federal constitution are frequently dismissed because the judgment can be uh, sustained on an independent state ground, okay? The court would not pass upon the validity of a statute upon complaint of one who fails to show that he is injured by its operation. Among the many applications of this rule, none is more striking than the denial of the right to challenge to one who lacks a personal or property right, okay, if you lack a personal or property right. While not mentioned in Ashwander, there are exceptions in the case of the First Amendment challenge where the party may raise the effect of a law on the person's First Amendment rights, the so-called chilling effect doctrine. Okay, and here's the one that really hits home. The court will not pass upon the constitutionality of a statute at the instance of one who has availed himself of his benefits. So if you've been using these statutes as a benefit, and then later on, you get want to come around and challenge it. They're not trying to hear that. They're not trying to hear it. Okay. Number seven, when the validity of an act of Congress is drawn into question, and even if a serious doubt of constitutionality is raised, it is the cardinal principle that this court will first ascertain whether a construction of the statute is fairly possible by which the question may be avoided. They're going to do everything in their power right, to prevent you from coming over in this Article 3 solely on the basis of separation of powers doctrine. Now you begin to understand why I'm telling you you have to understand separation of powers doctrine and delegation of powers doctrine, all right? You running out there getting mad and you don't understand how the law is constructed. You don't know where your rights are and you don't know what your rights are. You do have a right to privacy. You do have a right to be left alone, but you got to understand the bounds of that. And this is what I believe the... um the Amish understand. I think they may have some very, very intelligent people in their camp who understand this. I And it has to be based off of religion. There is this thing about religion that gets more exceptions than anything else is your religion when it's under some sort of a religious banner, okay? When you're serving God and so forth, when you're following God's law because all of the laws are based off the Bible. OK, these statutory codes and things like that, they have a root in the Bible. So if you're going to be following God's law, you got a right to do this. All right. I even have a book that talks about the churches. Churches don't have to be 5013Cs. Churches became 5013Cs when they began collecting Federal Reserve notes. OK, but a church, by definition, is already tax exempt. But they started these 5013Cs and now they're being taxed and all kind of things are happening to them. Um, there is a book that you can get off the internet. It's called In the Grip of Caesar that goes into that uh, uh, topic about the churches very heavily. Everybody who's listening to this, if you're a member of a church, you should read that book. I, I think it would be required of you to actually read that book so you can get some sort of understanding of what it means to render unto Caesar what is Caesar and unto the Lord what is the Lord's. A judge even said in that book, that, hey, they came into the realm of Caesar, 
He actually makes that statement talking about a church. Okay, so Jesus understood public and private. You should too. Okay, now these things are going to be required for you to know. These are called the Ashwander rules. Okay, and you need to know this, especially all you constitute people who uh, like to do constitutional challenges and things like this. I can't even understand how you could do a constitutional challenge and you don't know these seven principles that the Supreme Court uses. Um, a lot of guys who are locked up, they kind of understand that because they get back a lot of paperwork where the judges tell them this, but they may not quite understand because they don't know separation of powers of why the judiciary is doing this. It is because of separation of powers. You have to understand separation of powers, what that means, to understand how this legislature is doing what they're doing, how they had the right to create a corporation, that separation of powers, okay? How they, why, why everybody's saying, oh, they um, undermined the government in some kind of way. No, they didn't. They had a right to create a corporation. The thing that they did is they tricked you into getting a contract under that corporation, which is a municipal government for Washington, D.C. And I'm going to see if I can show you the law real quick on that so you can see what I'm talking about. Okay, and this book that we're looking in came out of the law library, and it came out of a book, um, United States Code Services. Um, and I put out the first volume of it, which was, and I went to the chapter on Article 1, Section 8, Clause 17, that goes into the 10 Mile Square of Washington, D.C. And right here, you can find where it talks about the legislative authority of district. Okay? And you need to read this very carefully, especially all you guys out there who keep talking about the Act of 1871. I was meant to undermine, you know, every time I see, I see these guys don't understand law and what they're talking about. But I can see why the people are really like nervous and call people threats and terrorists and things like that because of their misunderstanding of the law. And a lot of that comes from a lack of respect for the public. And I think also wanting something for nothing. People don't want to be, people have gotten this welfare state mentality. Um, a lot of people don't understand how to do a lot of things to themselves. You don't, you're not building your own houses anymore. You know, in a free country, you had to build your own house if you were a man. You had to get your own herds. You had to grow your own food. You had to do all these things yourself. Now everybody's providing you with everything, and you think there's some sort of inherent right to that when there's no right to that at all. These are privileges and benefits that are being dispensed to you. Uh, if you want to exercise your right, you need to learn how to start doing things for yourself. But right here in the legislative authority of district, Congress has power to invest District of Columbia with legislative authority. Okay, notice that Congress is doing this. Uh, and it says Congress had authority under the Constitution to delegate its lawmaking authority to a legislative assembly of municipal corporation, which was created by Organic Act of 1871. And rightful subjects of legislation within meaning of the act was as broad as the police power of state. Now, right here, what I want you to pay attention to is notice how they put in quotation marks, rightful subjects of legislation. Okay. They did a legislate. This is an act, okay? People say, well, it was made to undermine. I said, you guys don't understand law. You're talking about an act, man. This is an act, okay? This is not the Constitution. This is not creating anything. The Constitution created this. That's like me coming in my house and I'm making a rule in my house. I'm making a rule that, okay, everybody has to be in now at 11 o'clock at night, okay? That doesn't have far-reaching effect. It only applies in Washington, D.C., and I have the authority to do that because I have plenary power within my scope. Now, the trick may be if, say, the neighbors have children and they have a contract with me and say, hey, look, you know, we want you to uh, raise our children, too. And then I start saying, well, you have, your children have to follow the same rules that my children have to follow in my house, and they have to be in at 11 o'clock at night. Now, there's a contract. Yeah, they're not in my house, but they've contracted with me to follow my directives. That's what's happening with everyone with the Social Security card, birth certificate, these franchises or whatever you want to call it. This is how they um, extended themselves outside of federal jurisdiction, outside that 10 mile square and their insular possessions and got you involved in all of this. But stop saying that they, you know, try to undermine something or anything. They wasn't. They had the constitutional authority to create a municipal corporation, okay? Everything that they do is within their jurisdiction, okay? They don't act outside their jurisdiction. 
Okay, you are the one that doesn't understand your jurisdiction or where you're supposed to be. It's like somebody they got a um an episode of Ballers right now, the last episode where that wide receiver he accidentally went to the wrong house and knocked the dude out. You know, he thought he was in his house, but he walked in the wrong house. Okay, that's what everybody's doing. They're walking into somebody else's house trying to give demands try, and knock somebody else by accident and then get upset when the police come and snatch them up. Well, you're getting snatched up because you're not in your own house. Okay, you're in somebody else's house. There is a book that you can read. It's called The Republic is a House No One Lives In. You know, I want to one more time reiterate the importance of understanding the difference between public law and private law. Don't walk in anybody else's house. You need to know the difference between the two. Okay. If you learn this fundamental information, all right, first, contract law, where it's at, where constitutional law is, you'll hear a lot of, I've heard a lot of people come on and say how you're not party to the Constitution and things of that, uh, that nature. And um, I'm going to show you a couple of things real quick, some case law. Okay, and, and here we are. This case is Jones versus Timmer. This is a very interesting case on standing and uh, who has the authority to bring an action in an Article Three court. Very, very uh, interesting case that someone submitted to me. But in here was a very interesting uh, site that you find that talks about the privileges and immunities clause. And you need to read this very carefully so you can understand what, uh, what this public and private thing is all about. It says the privileges and immunities clause of the 14th Amendment protects very few rights because it neither incorporates any of the Bill of Rights nor protects all rights of individual citizens. See the slaughterhouse cases. And the slaughterhouse cases is something you should be very familiar with as well. Instead, this provision protects only those rights peculiar to being a citizen of the federal government, semicolon. It does not protect those rights which relate to state citizenship, all right? So it don't have nothing to do with the state. These people are telling you right here, you are a citizen of what? The federal government, okay? And that federal government is in that 10-mile square, which is in Washington, D.C., okay? And you'll, you'll see the picture start to talk. Now, we're talking about the 14th Amendment. Of course, that's constitutional law. So if you're a party to the Constitution, you're on here, you're on this side. Now, let me show you something about this party to the Constitution as well. And here we are on a case called Barron versus the City Council of Baltimore. Now, this is a case that every American citizen should read, especially all of you people talking about my constitutional rights and get upset when I say you're not a party to the Constitution. Uh, what made you a party to the Constitution was the 14th Amendment. This case was prior to the 14th Amendment. As you can see, it was in uh, uh, 1833. Okay. And it is very interesting. It's chock full of information. It's a U.S. Supreme Court case, as you can see. It's on a writ of error to the Court of Appeals from the Western Shore of the state of Maryland. And let's read the syllabus, which gives the overview of the case. It says, the provisions in the Fifth Amendment to the Constitution of the United States declaring that private property should not be taken for public use without just compensation is intended solely as a limitation on the exercise of power by the government of the United States and is not applicable to the legislation of the states. The Constitution was ordained and established by the people of the United States. And it's where people is something you need to look up in a Blacks for Fedition if you want to get an understanding because a lot of you think that you comprise the people. You don't. The people of the United States for themselves, for their own government. Well, who are the people of the United States if the states are somebody separate? For their own government and not for the government of the individual states. So right here you can see the government of the United States and the government of the individual states are two separate things. Each state established a constitution for itself, just like the United States got a constitution for itself. And in that constitution provided for such limitations and restrictions on the powers of this particular government as its judgment dictated. The people of the United States frame such a government for the United States as they suppose best adapted to their situation and best calculated to promote their interests. The powers they conferred on this government were to be exercised by itself and the limitations on power, if expressed in general terms, are naturally and necessarily applicable to the government created by the instrument. 
There are limitations of power granted in the instrument itself, not of distinct governments framed by different persons and for different purposes. Now, if you all understand that and let a judge, a Supreme Court justice tell you, I don't know what, what will. Yeah, some people probably gonna give me a thumbs down and argue with it, but you know, they're idiots. They, you know, they just gonna keep, you know, walling around in their own ignorance and thinking they got another answer for things. When these people are telling you what it is, all you have to do is understand public and private. And let me let me go on because it's something else I want to uh, 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 talk about too. And it's out of the dictionary, and this is where constitution, because people talk about constitutors and things of that nature. Well, let's look up the word constitution real quick. And I want to show you something very interesting about that particular word. Okay. And now we're back at the constitution. Okay. And this is Black's Law 8th edition. And I want to show you something really interesting about it. Okay. Now, of course, we have the first definition of the word, the fundamental and organic law of a nation or state that establishes the institutions and apparatus of government, defines the scope of governmental sovereign powers, and guarantees individual civil rights, not rights, not fundamental rights, and civil liberties. Uh, the written instrument embodying the fundamental law together with formal amendments. Now, I want to skip down to right here, this fourth sense of the word, which is parliamentary law. Now, parliamentary law is that law that governs legislatures, okay? And this ties into the Act of 1871 because it's called the Constitution of the United States. And a lot of people saying it's deceptive, um, it's illegal. No, it's not. You need to stop saying that. You look ignorant when you say that. And I just showed you the statute that says that you need to understand separation of powers. You need to understand uh, 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 um, um, delegation of powers and, you know, any other type of power that the government has. But separation of powers is the important one because they had the power to create that. They're, they've always done this. You can get a William Blackstone commentaries and it has whole sections on their own corporations and everything and how government uses them uh, for different purposes. Um, essentially, the, um, you know, that other constitution for their organization like a bylaw, and you'll see it right here. You'll see a governing document adopted by an organization for its internal governance, it don't have anything to do with you, and its external dealings. Now, this is just like a trust document. A trust document is for its internal governance, and it shows you how to do the external dealings. Same exact thing in trust. And it goes on, it says, the Constitution may be an organized uh, organization's most authoritative governing, uh, governing document, but if the organization also has a charter or adopted articles of incorporation or association, then the Constitution is subordinate to them. If the organization has also adopted bylaws, then the bylaws are subordinate to and usually more easily amended than the Constitution. And look, check this out. The Constitution and bylaws are sometimes contained in a single document. And this is like, you know, it's like the same thing with the Declaration of Trust and the Indenture Agreement are sometimes in separate documents and sometimes contained in the same document. You, you're going to find out these, this is a lot like the rap game. It's like how people be coming up with their own slang. You know, you start calling things different things. This is what you're going to start seeing um, uh, when you start studying this, there's a document called Woe Unto You Lawyers that you really need to check out uh, where this attorney, this is written by an attorney, he gets into this, the ridiculousness of the law. And I'm going to be putting out something uh, in the future on that as well. But I want you to pay attention to parliamentary law and put that in your uh, vocabulary and understand what parliamentary law is. Okay, that is under constitution. So when you're looking at this, um, corporate, this corporate United States, okay, and why they called it the Constitution of the United States. It's a, it is a document that is, it's like a commercial uh, uh, um, constitution. Of, uh, what I saw in a book where a judge called it a municipal constitution. They actually called it a municipal constitution because as I, I read, it was a municipal, they, they put it in the municipality of the District of Columbia. That's the only power that they delegated to them the power over that area and all of their insular possessions. So you've been tricked into contracting into this particular jurisdiction. And this is what you are striving to get out of. Now, if you're trying to get out of it, as it tells you in Revelation chapter 18, come out of her, my people, so you do not be partakers of her plagues. Okay, well, that's something else. You know, it's like, you know, you're trying to get all the way out. You're not trying to take advantage of TDA accounts or anything like that. But if you're trying to do business within the United States, well, 
that's an entirely different matter altogether. Now, the uh, document you see in front of you now is a quick breakdown of something that I put together to kind of illustrate how everything has been structured. And hopefully this will kind of help you put something in your mind's eye so you can see what's going on. Now, at the top here, you have the Constitution for the United States of America. Look at the difference between for and of. This is very significant. You should look those up in a dictionary. You have the preposition, the Constitution for the United States of America and the Constitution of the United States. OK, there is a distinct difference between these two. Um, the one that you primarily see posted everywhere in the back of books on the Internet and everywhere else is the Constitution of the United States. You're going to have to look very hard for this Constitution for the United States. I'll probably do a video uh, a little bit later on that particular time, uh, topic as well. But first, I wanted to give you a breakdown. Now, the organic Constitution, of course, you have the Article 1, Article 2, Article 3, the legislative, executive, and judicial branches of government, each having separations of powers and each forming checks and balances uh, on each other. Each also have what is called plenary power within their own respective branch of government. They cannot interfere with the other branch of government. So in this house right here, Article 1, okay, they have something that is called delegation of powers doctrine. Uh, and also, because of Article 1, Section 8, Clause 17, they have plenary power over the District of Columbia. They can do whatever they want to do, basically, within their sovereign power. They created something called the, uh, uh, the United States, which is a corporation. You can see uh, at, uh, also at United States Code, Title 28, Section 3215, United States is defined as a corporation. It's also in, um, in the UCC. Let me show that to you real quick. Now, we are in the UCC, Article 9307, which is called Location of the Deptor. Very interesting. And we go on down to H, we see find something very interesting. The United States is located in the District of Columbia. I know I'm going to have some people argue with me, but it's stacks and mounds of mounds upon case law that support this. But, you know, maybe I'll just go into a long dissertation on what is this United States, because they're tricking us with this word United States and its three different meanings and the application and senses how they're applied in different situations. But they'll always tell you something out front. The United States is located in the District of Columbia. Wow. That looks interesting. Okay. So let's continue. Uh, let me go back to uh, my outline of the Constitution. So you can see right here, this legislative branch, what they did was the Act of 1871. They created this corporation called United States. Now, this corporation also has legislative power, executive power, and judicial power within its own branch. Obviously, they have judicial power because they have, an, uh, they have a legislative court system. That's Article 1, Section 8, Clause 3. All right. They have executive power due to their delegation of powers doctrine, where they delegate some of their legislative power to the executive agencies of government, such as Department of State, Department of Treasury, Department of Defense, Department of Justice, FBI, Department of the Interior, Department of Agriculture, Department of Commerce, Department of Labor, Department of Health and Human Services, Department of Housing and Urban De uh, Development, Department of Transportation, Department of Energy, Department of Education, Department of Ver Veteran Affairs, Department of Homeland Security, and United States Secret Service. These are all executive agencies. And there's supposed to be a separation of powers uh, claw, uh, doctrine that they have to abide by. But um, this is <laughs> they're delegating power to them. It's called delegation of powers doctrine. Uh, Judge Antonio Scalia, he did not like this at all. You know, he says he feels like it's unconstitutional. And I'll play this little short video for you just to show you what I mean real quick. Certainly. Thank you, uh, Justice Scalia and Justice Breyer, for joining us. It's an honor to have you here today. Um, Justice Scalia, I, w I wanted to follow up on some things you had said in your opening statement. Uh, along the lines that it is and properly should be a difficult, cumbersome, time-consuming process in our constitutional republic to enact legislation. I think the courts can and should um, uh, play a, a, a significant role in ensuring that that's always the case. The, the court certainly has played a role in the past uh, in cases like INS v. Chatham, in which the court has stepped in and said, you know, notwithstanding the fact that you, Congress, may have found something that 
makes the process of legislating easier or perhaps even more efficient or collegial, uh, you haven't dotted your I's and crossed your T's in the same way that we contemplated under Article 1, right. Section 7, Clause 2, uh, requiring bicameral passage and then presentment. Uh, and, and so this provision is invalid. Um, so uh, let me ask you the, the question, is there also a role for the courts? Can you foresee a role in the, uh, for the courts in other situations in which Congress, some future hypothetical Congress, might do something different that would prove easier and more efficient and more collegial, but perhaps uh, in a way that's, that's antithetical to the Constitution? For instance, let's suppose that Congress, when legislating on the delicate uh, and pressing issue of uh, maintaining the um, proper records in uh, the dog breeding industry. Uh, since we're talking about federal legislation, these would of course be dogs either moving in commerce or taking advantage of some channel or instrumentality of interstate commerce. But uh, a, a law in which Congress just passes a law saying we're outsourcing, we're delegating the authority to regulate dog breeding and record keeping for purebred dogs to the board of directors of the American Kennel Club. That passes both houses of Congress. It goes to the president. It's signed into law. And we then have outsourced the regulation of this practice to the American Kennel Club. Is that a situation in which you can anticipate the court might step in? Well, I would step in. I don't know if the court would. I, I, I was, I was the, dis, uh, the dissenting vote in, in the uh, first case involving uh, Oh, I, I hate to mention this with my friend Stephen here, since he was on the right. Sentencing Commission. I thought when, when, when Congress created a Sentencing Commission to decide how many years everybody should spend in jail, because presumably Congress didn't have the time to figure it out for themselves and just left it to this commission to do it, I didn't think that that was constitutional. So I, I, I am sure I wouldn't like your, your, your dog breeding body either. But I, 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 can't, I can't speak for the court. I don't know what the court would allow. But for you personally, uh, uh, looking at it, notwithstanding the fact that it's more efficient, notwithstanding the fact that you do have bicameral passage and you have presentment of this hypothetical law, the problem is that you have delegated the lawmaking power. Exactly. And, well, and you have exactly. To, you have to be careful because John Jay, I just read this in John Stevens' book. It's pretty good. Uh, the first chapter, he says, John Jay, you know, first chief justice, and George Washington went to him and said, you know, I have a lot of questions here. I'd like to, I don't want to do anything unconstitutional. Here are a bunch of them. Will you answer them? And John Jay said, no, no, no advisory opinions. He said, we're not giving any advice. But the real reason, of course, is he didn't know the answer. <laughs> so that's what I'm thinking. And he was right. And he yeah, was right. right. And his tenure on the court proved to be short-lived yes, in any event. Uh, now, the, the, the situation you pose is quite different, of course, from your, your, your leaving it to an agency. So fill, uh, how is it different then? How, how do those differ? Well, because when you leave it to an agency, you are, you, you are giving it to the executive. The executive can make rules. You, you can't run a, an executive operation without, without making rules. The doors open at 8 o'clock. If you're the Interior Department, you can't have fires on public land. You can graze private cattle on. It's, it's up to the agency to make rules. But... There, there, there is an obstacle that discourages you from giving too much power to the executive agency because you are increasing the power of the president. You're a competitor to the president. You know, the separation of powers with different branches uh, competing. And uh, there is no such disincentive when you leave it to this private group that you're talking about. That is just a pure delegation of legislative power. You are not authorizing an executive to act like an executive, but you are delegating legislative power to a, a group that has no executive responsibilities. So the difference you would insist is based on the fact that this is an executive branch agency, which at least in theory is subject to the disposition, subject to the control, the, to the direction of the chief, chief executive. I think that's right, and I, I am, I am, <laughs> what can I, uh, you're talking about the doctrine of, of unconstitutional delegation of legislative authority, which, which is a, a bad name for it because there is no such thing as a constitutional delegation of legislative authority. You cannot delegate legislative authority. Uh, now, when you give rulemaking to an agency, how far can you go? Can Congress just get together and say, uh, the president can do anything he wants and adjourn? 
Of course not. That has to be unconstitutional. But is it up to the courts to decide where the line is drawn between giving enough authority to the chief executive and too much authority? It is, it is simply a non-justiciable question, and, and I, for one, would not apply, would not let the courts apply the doctrine of unconstitutional delegation, where the delegation is to the executive. As long as it's to the executive branch agency, then even I if wouldn't we, get into it. You, Some of my if, colleagues would, I, I suppose. Even in the, in the extreme situation where we passed a law saying, for example, we shall have good law, the power to make good law is hereby delegated to the Department yeah. of Good Law, which oh, is hereby got, created. I'd do that one, all right. But that's not going to happen. I'm okay. talking about any real situation. I can't, I can't imagine my, my sticking my toe in that water. Okay, okay. Okay, so you can see right here um, the judicial power that is exercised under the legislature pursuant to Article 1, Section 8, Clause 3. This is why you have what is called Article 1 courts. Now, this is coming out of Black's Law, 8th edition, all these definitions. And you can see it says, see legislative court under court. It's a type of federal legislative court that is not bound by the requirements of or protected under U.S. Constitution, Article 3, Section 2, and that performs functions similar to those of an administrative agency, such as issuing advisory opinions. Now, this is also where you get into the admiralty, because these administrative agencies, that's what they're doing there enforcing admiralty upon you. And they're telling you it's not really a court, it's an administrative agency. I keep telling people this, even in the, uh, if you're in federal prison and you catch a shot, okay, they go, you have to go get your counselor to represent you. You go before a board, okay, then they find you guilty and then they put you in a hole. That's called administrative law. Well, they're doing the same thing when you go into a federal court, okay? This is a violation of interstate commerce and they're administering something against you. They're using administrative law against you. And you read administrative law, you will see everything that they're doing in the courtroom. It's not a real court. It is an administrative court. And they're telling you right here. And the expert commentary, it'll get into it and explain it a little bit more right here as we can read. And it tells you. Congress also has power within certain limits to create what are called Article I tribunals. And that is Article I, Section 8, Clause 3. These Article I tribunals are really akin to administrative agencies. Notice they use the word really. Like, they call it Article I tribunals, but what they really are are administrative agencies. That is, the judges do not have any constitutionally guaranteed lifetime tenure and protection from salary diminution. Now, here's the trick. They'll say, well, it doesn't have the quality. The judges over there don't have the quality of an Article III judge. Well, separation of powers tells us two distinct things, man. This is why they kind of try to give you an explanation that doesn't quite explain it to you. We know that these Article I judges are elected and appointed in office and so forth, and they have a term, and that real judges have a lifetime tenure and you can't affect their money. But that's only one quality of it. You got to look at what these people are trying to do with your mind and everything, get you thinking a certain way. They're not governed by the case or controversy limitation of Article III. At the present time, Article I courts include territorial courts, certain courts of the District of Columbia courts martial and legislative courts and administrative agencies that adjudicate public rights. And this is the thing that I'm saying with all of you out there listening is a lot of you do not respect the public. The public has rights, okay? And you are not in the public, you are in the private. And you have to respect the rights of the public if you want them to respect the rights of the private. And for you to know what the private is, you gotta find out exactly what the limits of private rights are. So you will not cross over that line. It goes on. Let's read what something else it says. This is coming out of Black's Law, 8th edition as well. When enforcing, when acting to enforce a statute and its subsequent amendments to the present date, the judge of the municipal court is acting as an administrative officer and not in a judicial capacity. There's a semicolon that gives an explanation. Know your rules of grammar, okay? Courts in administering or enforcing statutes do not act judicially, but merely ministerially. They're acting ministerially. Okay, now when you have a ministerial power, okay, that means that you don't have to have skill, you don't have to have, you're just doing what somebody is to telling you to do. That's what ministerial duty, you can look this up. Okay, and you can also see right here, a judge ceases to sit as a judicial officer because the governing principle of administrative law provides that courts are prohibited from substituting their evidence, testimony, record, arguments, and rationale for that of the agency. 
Additionally, courts are prohibited from substituting their judgment for that of the agency. Courts and administrative issues are prohibited from even listening to or hearing arguments, presentation, or rationale. Okay, and that is because, all right, Article Three judges is separation of powers. All this is tied into separation of powers. You need to understand separation of powers, everyone, if you're going to understand uh, what is going on with your court system. And also, if you're going to understand the Act of 1871, you need to understand separation of powers. All these things that you see all these people on the Internet talking about, where they're just sitting on there talking, but they're not pulling out things and showing and explaining this to you and everything. You need to find this out for yourself and do your own research. And stop sitting on your behind and listening to what these people are saying because most of them don't know what they're talking about. They sit up there talking about the government is stealing. The government is not stealing anything from you. What it is is that you turned your back on the creator and you're putting all of your you're putting all of your hope in men. Okay? And that is what this whole game is about. It's showing you that that is a fallacy to put your hope in men. The only thing that you can put your hope in is something that is immutable, meaning it's something that doesn't change something that doesn't flip flop like the wind, something that is stable. And that is the creator of the balanced universe and the laws that even implemented to regulate everything in creation called nature. You got to get back to nature. I'm Yusuf Ayer. High Frequency Radio. Peace to the God. I'm out.